with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. So help us God. What do you know of long ago of what we call our history? How many words have you overheard about folks like you and me? What do you know of times gone by, of heritage and home? What do you know and was it so? Things you've never known. What can we say about yesterday? And what has gone before? We know you've been told of heroes, though. Listen and we'll tell you more. Gather around and all sit down. Listen closely because we're gonna tell it like it was. Langston Hughes has been called the Poet Laureate of Harlem, the greatest Negro writer, the giant of black literature, the finest Negro poet of his generation, etc. But because I am here to tell it like it was, I'm not going to call him by any of those titles. For Langston Hughes, like many other black writers, does not need the safety of a special category, black to be entitled to such superlatives. The products of his genius, poems, short stories, novels, plays, operas, articles, etc., can compete with those from the entire field of American writers and come out amongst the best. Langston Hughes is not only a giant of black literature, he is a giant of American literature. He was not only the finest Negro poet of his generation, he was one of the finest poets of his generation. Yet, not only is this immensely talented writer dealt with in anthologies of American literature in a special category of black writers, but the many anthologies on the library shelves do not even include him. Langston Hughes is probably the best known writer of the Harlem literary renaissance. He wrote the Declaration of Independence of the black writer, demanding the freedom to write out of his own experiences rooted in blackness, in any new form he thought appropriate, and also demanding that his work be judged on its artistic merit, not on the basis of what anyone thought black literature ought to be. Through all of his years of writing, 1918 until his death in 1967, Langston Hughes' works maintained a universality that, that is to say, they could be read by people of other nations and other races, and these people would understand them and be able to relate to them. But Hughes was, after all, a black man, and this colored his experiences, pardon the pun, and his outlook. Many of his poems danced to the changing rhythms and music of his people. Morning, Daddy. Ain't you heard the boogie-woogie rumble of a dream deferred? Listen closely. You hear their feet beating out and beating out a... You think it's a happy beat? Listen to it closely. Ain't you heard something underneath like a... What did I say? Sure, I'm happy. Take it away. Hey, Bob, free Bob, ha! Yeah. If he hadn't written anything else, I think I'd always be indebted to Langston Hughes for writing this ode 
to that silent, mostly unsung heroine of our race, the Negro mother. Children, I come back today to tell you a story of the long dark way that I had to climb, that I had to know in order that the race might live and grow. Look at my face, dark as the night, yet shining like the sun in love's true light. I am the child they stole from the sand. 300 years ago in Africa's land, I am the dark girl who crossed the wide sea, carrying in my body the seed of the free. I am the woman who worked in the field, bringing the cotton and the corn to yield. I am the one who labored as a slave, beaten and mistreated for the work that I gave. Children sold away from me, husbands sold too. No safety, no love, no respect was I due. I couldn't read then, I couldn't write. I had nothing back there in the night. Sometimes the valley was filled with tears, but I kept trudging on through the lonely years. Sometimes the road was hot with sun, but I had to keep on till the work was done. I had to keep on, no stopping for me. I was the seed of the coming free. I nourished the dream that nothing could smother deep in my breast the Negro mother. I had only hope then, but now through you, dark ones of today, my dreams must come true. All you dark children in the world out there, remember my sweat, my pain, my despair. Remember my years heavy with sorrow and make of those years a torch for to borrow. Believe in the right. Let none push you back. Remember the whip and the slaver's track. Remember how the strong in struggle and strife still bar you the way and deny you life. But march ever forward, breaking down bars. Look ever upward at the sun and the stars. Oh, my dark children, my dreams and my prayers impel you forever up the great stairs. For I will be with you till no white brother dares keep down the children of the Negro mother. Hush, little baby. Don't you cry You know your mama's bound to die Oh My trial was a little book once given to me and every page spelled a liberty oh, 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 oh. my trial Lord
Langston Hughes was very much a poet of the people, the common man. He presented them in all their beauty and ugliness too. He wrote, I personally know very few people anywhere who were wholly beautiful and wholly good. Besides, I felt that the masses of our people have as much in their lives to put into books as those more fortunate ones who have been born with some means and the ability to work up to a master's degree at a northern college. Anyway, I didn't know the upper class Negroes well enough to write about them. I knew only the people I had grown up with and they weren't the people whose shoes were always shined or who had been to Harvard or had heard of Bach. But they seemed to me to be good people too. Langston was always to be found around the common people. Wherever he went, and he traveled widely, he sought them out and he found them. In Mexico, France, Italy, in Africa, Harlem. In fact, it was while he was making the rounds of some Harlem bars that he met the man who inspired his most famous fictional character, Jesse B. Simple better known as just plain simple. Now who is simple? Well, simple is a character who originated during the war. His first words came directly out of the mouth of a young man who lived just down the block from me. Not knowing much about the young man, I asked him where he worked. And he said, in a war plant. I said, what do you make? He said, cranks. I said, what kind of cranks? He said, Oh, man, I don't know what kind of cranks, I said. What do the cranks crank? Do they crank cars, tanks, buses, or what? And he said, I don't know what them cranks crank. Whereupon his girlfriend said, Now, looks like by now you ought to know what them cranks crank. Oh, woman, he said, You know white folks don't tell colored folks what cranks crank. That was the beginning of Simple. Out of the mystery as to what the cranks of this world crank evolved this character, wondering and laughing at the numerous problems of white folks, colored folks, and just folks, including himself. Simple, what is it you love about Harlem? Oh, it's so full of Negroes. I feel like I got protection. From what? White folks. Furthermore, I like Harlem because it belongs to me. Lots of white folks are scared to come up here, too, after dark. I am sorry white folks are scared to come to Harlem, but I'm scared to go around some of them, too. Why, for instance, in my hometown once before I came north, I was walking down the street when a white woman jumped out of her door and said, Boy, get away from here, because I'm scared of you. I said, Why? She said, Because you were so black. I said, lady, I'm scared of you because you were so white. I went on down the street, but I kept wishing I was blacker so I could have scared that lady to death. Imagine, somebody talking about they scared of me because I'm black. I got more reason to be scared of white folks than nigga has to be scared of me. My boss is white. Most bosses are. Well, and being white and curious, my boss keeps asking me just what does the Negro want. Now, he always says, the Negro as if there was not 50, 11 different kinds of Negroes in the USA. Well, my boss says, now that you all got the Civil Rights Bill and the Supreme Court, Adam Clayton Powell and Congress and Ralph Bunch in the United Nations, Lentine Price singing in the Met, plus Dr. King getting a Nobel Prize, well, what more do you want? I'm asking you, what does the Negro want? Well, I'm not the Negro, I says. I am me. Well, says my boss, you represent the Negro. I do not, I says. I represent myself. Now, Ralph Bunch represents you then, says my boss. And Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King, do they not? Well, I am proud to be represented by such men if you say they represent me, I says. But all them men you name are way up there, and they don't drink in my bar. So far as I know, they don't even live in Harlem. I cannot find them in the telephone book. They all got private numbers. But since you say they represent the Negro, why do you not ask them what the Negro wants? I cannot get to them, says my boss. Neither can I. So I, I said, so we both in the same boat.
Langston Hughes wrote a fantastic number of books, ten volumes of poems, four volumes of short stories, two plays called Malata and Simply Heavenly, operas, musicals, biographies, histories, and other books for children. I've read many of them, but what I didn't know was that reading his life was as interesting as reading his books. Recently, I found this little gem. It's called The Big C, and, and I thought I could share it with you. Hughes wrote The Big C about the early part of his life, up to about the age of 28. There is another autobiography called I Wonder As I Wander. The, the Big C is a story so warmly and simply told, so full of am amusing accounts, peopled with so many famous black writers and artists of the 20s and 30s, and full of the flavor of the Harlem of that time. Well, I, j I just had to read it all at one sitting. Langston was born in Missouri in 1900 and, and two, but, but grew up mostly in Kansas. When he was six years old, his father left his mother and went to live in Mexico. So Langston moved around a lot as a child between different homes. He, he went to live with his grandmother when he was about seven. Life was a struggle because money was scarce and he was unhappy and lo lonesome there. His grandmother was a proud woman and she used to dazzle him with wonderful stories of slavery times and Negroes struggle for freedom. Nobody ever cried in my grandmother's stories. They worked or schemed or fought, but no crying. When my grandmother died, I didn't cry either. Something about my grandmother's stories taught me the uselessness of crying about anything. He was 12 when his grandmother died, so he went to live with an aunt and eventually went back to his mother who had remarried. When it came time for graduation from grammar school, he was made class poet. In America, most white people think, of course, that all Negroes can sing and dance and have a sense of rhythm. So my classmates, knowing that a poem had to have rhythm, elected me, thinking, no doubt, that I had some, being a Negro. That was the way I began to write poetry. When Langston was 17, a telegram arrived out of the blue one day from his father. He was coming through Cleveland and Langston was to get himself together and meet him at the train. He was taking Langston back to Mexico with him for the summer. His father, he hadn't seen him in 11 years. In my mind, I pictured my father as a kind of strong bronze cowboy in a big Mexican hat, in a land where there were no white folks to draw the color line and no tenements with rents always due, just mountains and sun and cactus, Mexico. Langston couldn't wait because, because he was late receiving the next telegram, he thought his father had left without him. He was walking down Central Avenue toward the hotel where he thought his father was staying. About three blocks away, he saw a man with a mustache. They looked at each other closely when they passed, then turned and looked back. It was his father. Are you Langston, asked his father. Why weren't you at the train last night? We moved, and I didn't get your wire till this morning, replied Langston. Hmm. Just like niggas, he spat out, always moving. Are you ready to go? That summer in Mexico was the most miserable I've ever known. I didn't like my father. He was interested only in making money. My father had a great contempt for all poor people. He thought it was their fault that they were poor, and he hated Negroes. I think he hated himself, too, for being a Negro. He disliked all of his family because they were Negroes and remained in the United States, where none of them had a chance to be much of anything but servants, like my mother. I didn't understand it because I was a Negro, and I liked Negroes very much. They seemed to me like the gayest and the bravest people possible. 
facing tremendous odds, working, laughing, and trying to get somewhere in the world. By the time he was 17, Langston had a whole notebook full of poems. In the next four years, he was to write a great deal of poetry, for as he said, his best poems were written when he felt the worst. He managed to convince his father to pay for a college education and decided to go to Columbia University. It was a way of getting where he really wanted to go, Harlem. Ordinary Negroes didn't like the growing influx of whites toward Harlem after sundown, flooding the little cabarets and bars where formerly only colored people laughed and sang, and where now the strangers were given the best ringside tables to sit and stare at the Negro customers, like amusing animals in a zoo. The Negro said, we can't go downtown and sit and stare at you and your clubs. You won't even let us in your clubs. But they didn't say it out loud. The Negroes are practically never rude to white people. So thousands of whites came to Harlem night after night, thinking the Negroes loved to have them there, and firmly believing that all Harlemites left their houses at sundown to sing and dance in cabarets. Because well, most of the whites saw nothing but the cabarets not the houses. The ordinary Negroes hadn't heard of the Negro Renaissance. And if they had, well, it hadn't raised their wages any. There are many, many other aspects of Langston's early life touched on in this charming book. His encounter with Washington society, who didn't quite know what to make of this poet, a published poet, no less, who thought nothing of taking a job in a wet wash laundry to earn a living. Hughes wrote, They lived in comfortable homes, had fine cars, and dressed well, but seemed altogether lacking in real culture, kindness, or good common sense. Langston had to be around folks. From all this pretentiousness, 7th Street was a sweet relief. 7th Street is the long, old, dirty street where the ordinary Negroes hang out. Folks with practically no family tree at all. Folks who draw no color line between mulattoes and deep, dark browns. Folks who work hard for a living with their hands. On 7th Street in 1924, they played the blues, ate watermelon, barbecue, and fish sandwiches, shot pool, told tall tales, looked at the dome of the Capitol, and laughed out loud. I tried to write poems like the songs they sang on 7th Street. Gay songs, because you had to be gay or die sad songs because I couldn't help being sad sometimes but sad or gay you kept on living and you kept on going their song those of 7th Street had the pulse beat of the people who keep on going the big C only takes Langston Hughes's life up to 1932 the book leaves him on the threshold of his literary career, for indeed, this talented man went on to produce so many more worthwhile works that it would leave me breathless to recite them all. He wrote right up until the time of his death, and in 1967, here's what he says at the end of The Big C. Literature is a big sea full of many fish, I let down my nets and pulled. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. 
gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Everywhere I go I mean to let it shine Everywhere I go I mean to let it shine Everywhere I go Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave me a light, and I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave me a light, and I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, when I is free, I'm gonna let it shine. When I'm gonna let it shine when I is free. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. tomorrowpictures.tv <laughs>